Thank you, Linnell. I always say it's the wrong place to put the sermon is after somebody sings. It just, you can't. Wanda usually points at me and says, follow that. And so, um, but thank you, Linnell. And the Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to John chapter 12. Begin with verse 20 and read through verse 33. As you're turning there, I want to make just a, sort of a housekeeping announcement of sorts. Uh, Sally and I are leaving to go to China on April 11th, uh, which is way closer than it should be. Uh, and we, I will be out of the pulpit while we are in China and also for at least two more weeks after that. So uh, I will be gone on April 11th and I'll be back here the second Sunday of May. Uh, in that time, though, I'm leaving you, I hope, in capable hands, familiar friends, and one new one. Uh, but in, uh, are you, as we get closer to that time, you'll know more about that. But we do covet your prayers in the days ahead. Uh, pray that my passport doesn't get lost in FedEx on the way back. Pray for safe travel as we go. Uh, and pray for our little son, Carter. We're excited to bring him home. So um, Let's look now in John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20, reading through to verse 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake. Not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, give us ears to hear, ears to hear your words, God, and not mine. Words that call us more and more into the light of your love. Words that reveal more of who you are, more of who you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, it is the fifth Sunday of Lent, but it's also um, the Sunday after a rather important dec uh, anniversary of mine. Uh, ten years ago this past Friday, I was ordained uh, into the gospel ministry by Shadescrest Baptist Church in Hoover, Alabama. And I thought, as I read this text, as I read about these Greeks who came to Philip and said, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I thought about how that was true for me in some ways, that the way that I came to this calling was when someone said, I wish to see Jesus. This little four-year-old boy. I shouldn't have thought about this because Cole's going to be four. I said, I wasn't going to do this today. Uh, anyway, um, and so I thought about I thought about my call. And so I wrote some stuff down. You've probably read it. If you have, check out, play tic-tac-toe in the bulletin. That's fine. But I want to read this uh, to you. 
Uh, Ten years ago, this past Friday, I was ordained at Shades Crest uh, by the good folks there, one of whom, uh, two actually, on the night that we honor Bob, we're also honoring Sarah and Sigurd Bryan. Sarah was the chair of deacons at uh, Shades Crest when I was ordained and played the organ there for a very long time. And Sigurd is, uh, we call him Saint Sigurd. We should have his, his picture in the, in the chapel at Samford. He was a well-respected and much-loved religion professor. Well, they were there at Shades Crest when I was ordained. And this church affirmed my calling to serve Christ and his church through the practices of pastoral and congregational ministry. Their pastor there at the time, my friend Dennis Faust, shaped much of the way that I look and think about God and about ministry. But I have to tell you, if I knew then what I know now, there's a good chance I would have been ordained to sell insurance or teach high school algebra. Because it hasn't been easy. But to tell you the truth, I knew it wouldn't be easy. In fact, I remember when I told my home church, a man named James Gray. James uh, had known my dad for a long time, so he knew all the stuff on me. James had one arm and was one of the best body men, painting body men you'd ever meet. And I remember he, he met me at the back door of the church when I told the church that I felt called to ministry. And he just shook his head and said, you're never going to make any money. And it's going to be hard. You sure you want to do it? You're a pretty good mechanic. I said, and I, it ain't about wanting to do it. I'm called. So like most things in life, people can tell you a hundred times a day how things will be. But there's still something within you, at least within me, that wants to prove them all wrong. Something within me that wants to triumph over the challenges of the past and straighten out the difficulties of former generations. I suppose we might call that hope. I listened to mentors tell me about being threatened by church members, how they had been verbally and physically assaulted in their offices. I even watched a pastor get punched in the face in a parking lot once. I listened to stories of how people had come into pastors' homes and threatened their financial security. If you don't shut up and shape up, I'm going to take my money away from you. And I've had friends who had what's called a gang of three persuade an entire congregation of hundreds that the best thing they could do to keep the peace was to force their pastor to resign. I witnessed firsthand how the narrow-mindedness of an individual can derail the ministry of a church simply by causing a scene in a budget meeting that led to removing the entire budget of a youth program simply because one member of that committee no longer had children involved. That was my home church, in case you're wondering. I listen to stories about how congregations refuse to take any of the blame for failed programs. I heard pastors talk about churches that split over where to plant a tree. I've heard all these things, all these stories, and still could not ignore the call of God. So now in my 13th year of ministry and after a decade of ordination, I've witnessed my own stories. And many of them, to be honest with you, are cliches. Situations and experiences that I thought surely were not real, that would surely never happen, or were only relics of a generation before mine. In one church, there were members who believed that they had literally bought the church, including their own pews in the back of the church. They'd purchase a thing or two here, like a copier or a file cabinet, and then they'd say, well, well, the church can use the first two rows of it, but we're going to use the rest of it. And they always wanted a tax receipt. And they let me know that their donation was part of their tithe. There was the chair of a search committee who told me, if we had told you the truth, you wouldn't have wanted to come. In other words, we lied to you. There was the deacon who left because I wasn't a strict adherent to the inerrancy of the authorized King James Version 1611 because I said that Paul actually meant not junia, but junio, in Romans, because that's what he did. I had a staff member once threaten to call me a heretic in front of the congregation because of my support of women in ministry. I had families who lied about the frequency of my pastoral visits to their family members. I had a church member who literally once told me, I give a lot of money and shouldn't have to ask you how to spend it. Then there are the countless conversations, and I use that word loosely, that I've had to sit through, usually in criticism of a sermon or some post from someone on social media or something they saw someone do down at the convenience store. 
There are the times when my wife and I have been left out of things, when my friends, the few friends I had, either turned their backs on me or came under severe scrutiny from others because they were the pastor's friend. And then I was told once that I belonged somewhere else because of my slight disagreement and belief. There have been times when a minority voice has driven me to the brink while the majority has remained silent. And I suppose I could go on about those things. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm going to be doing it for a lot longer, but I won't, because the truth is, even with all that, I still feel called to this. And I still feel called here. After 10 years of ordination, I still feel called to this hard, heavy, frustrating, sometimes soul-draining life. Because for every empty complaint session I've had to sit through, for every ignorant dissertation I've had patience enough to endure, for every meaningless motion, every threat, every lie, and every pain I've had to endure at the hands and words of those who claim to follow the same Christ that I do, there have been moments where I've seen the kingdom crack through and God's glory become real. Like the time Steve, and that's not his real name, called me. I didn't recognize the phone number on my little flip phone. That's how long ago it was. I didn't recognize the number, but I answered it anyway. Steve had to tell me who he was. I didn't recognize his number. I didn't recognize his name. He had only visited our small church a few times. But he had heard me preach once on Jesus' words about forgiveness. How it's not seven times, but 70 times seven times. He was so convicted by Christ's words that in spite of his severe social anxiety that had driven him to disability and to the local radius of his own home of no more than five miles, he drove across four states to find his father, a man who had raped him and his sister when they were children, a man Steve had deleted from his life. He drove across four states to find him. And I'll be honest with you, when I heard him saying I had 911 on my phone, ready to call it, thinking that Steve had murdered his father. And he said, Chris, I found him. I knocked on the door. I hugged him and forgave him. Or that time that 17 of us from this church went to Haiti. Some of us had never been out of the country. And I witnessed just the way a small exposure to God's kingdom in another context works to chip away the culturally ingrained biases and beliefs that we contain about other people. Or the countless times that I've sat by the bedside of someone who took their last breath, and I'm going to say it and she ain't going to like it, a lot of times with Eva Barker. While their family sang hymns, while their families told stories, the countless times, The countless times that God has called me to use my gifts, whatever they are, whatever paltry offering they are, to bring some sense of peace to a family who is grieving the loss of a loved one. Then there are those innumerable conversations over lunch, work projects, sitting on a porch around a coffee table, most of the time not with very preacher-like language. Y'all know what that means. Conversations where the reality of God's kingdom is discussed in much deeper ways than trite Platonisms and memorized proof text. In recent years, many of those conversations have taken place four feet in the ground as I've helped to dig graves for many of the saints in this community. Things that my colleagues in ministry still are just guffawed by. You dig graves? I thought machines did that. What are you talking about? No. That's when you get real. When you get down in the grave with somebody. There are those holy, precious moments when the kingdom becomes so real that I really just want the world to stop spinning. Because I feel like we might be getting it right. Moments when it feels like I'm, I'm closest to getting this thing called ministry right. When I might be clicking on all cylinders with God. There's those moments, those moments when you see someone finally get it, when the weight just comes off their shoulders and the light comes into their eyes. 
Those times when you feel like this thing called church might actually work and the world might actually be transformed if we could all just hold on to those moments and create more like them. And maybe that's why I can't let go of all this. And I mean it that way. I can't let go of it. It doesn't have me because the truth is I could walk away from it and let someone else deal with it. Deal with all the frustration and hurt, high blood pressure and bovine excrement. I could walk away from it. I could do something else. I could lay it down whenever, but I would never feel right about it after. In fact, I remember one of the first conversations I had when I went to Samford. I sat in Jim Barnett's office. He was the university minister at that time. Jim's now a member of the religion department and the pastor at Brookwood Baptist in Birmingham. Jim's dad taught, uh, Henley taught ethics at Southern and had his job threatened because he brought Martin Luther King on campus in the 60s. But Jim and I were sitting in his office. I was interviewing for the ministerial scholarship, which that, and back then was only $1,500. Now it's $16,000. i am trying to find a way to retroactively apply that. Jim said, Chris, if you can do anything else, anything else and be happy, you need to do it. I might sleep a little better. I might have more weekends to spend with my family. I don't know what it's like to to have a Sunday, you know, where you can go fishing or something. I might have more time in general. But there would be a very real part of me that's missing. A very real part. So 10 years into this life, I'm ordained ministry despite all the hell it can bring, and sometimes in spite of all that it can, I still believe that God's called me to it. I still believe this thing called congregational ministry is worth doing, because we're not all monolithic robots walking around trying to follow the same understanding of God. We are all unique people with our own baggage and our own things we bring to God and His kingdom to serve Him, and to ignore that is just wrong. I still find that those small glimpses of God's glory shining through the cracks we made in the facade of superficial religion are powerful enough to call me onward, ever onward in this journey to share the truth. The one truth that when someone comes to me and says, I want to see Jesus, I pray like anything they see at least a glimpse in me. To share the truth of God's limitless, unconditional love in Christ Jesus with the world. And to call others to join me on this journey. Because I still believe I'm called to show Jesus others. I still believe I'm called when somebody says, we wish to see Jesus. And God's calling me to show him. I believe he's calling you too. And I believe there are other voices among us that call us to that work. Not just one ordained. And so with that, I want to ask one of those voices to come share now. And this will be, in a way, in place of our hymn of invitation. I want to ask Wendell to come and share what he's wrote with us this morning. Sometimes when, uh, at least ways for me, and maybe maybe for a lot of y'all, maybe all everyone sitting out out here right now. I've always I found out over the years. It's took a long time to learn it, but most of the time when things get the toughest, I need to get the simplest. I need to go back to the most simple things that I was raised by. And I remember, because then it helps to put everything to its right perspective. And uh, I, I, I apologize this morning if uh, these words, uh, a few people have already heard them, but uh, bear with me. And uh, I've said this before, standing right here, these words aren't mine. I I will not take credit. I don't want I, no boastfulness whatsoever. They're not mine. All I've done is write the words down that's been given to me. 
And that happened this morning. This morning, whether rightly or wrongly, I felt the need to share these words with all of you. If it is wrong of me, please forgive me. But the Spirit of Christ has urged me. These are His words, not mine. 168 years ago, I gave birth to you. I watched you start from the humblest of beginnings. I watched you turn a simple log house into a house of worship. My little country church had no idea then what dreams and realities that would lie ahead for her. Through the decades, I've watched her grow. I've married young teenage sweethearts as their, as their proud parents stood by and gave praise to our Lord for this small country church. I've raised your children, always giving them an inner feeling. I'm home here. I'm safe here. Surrounded by loving parents, and loving friends all around them. I've watched you grow and grow, my little country church. Has become what I envisioned long ago. Over the years, I've raised up men and women among you to guide you in my direction. Some fathers and mothers, some uncles and aunts, some loving friends, some total strangers. And over the years, I've called many to my side, and I praised all of their lead I praised all for their leadership. But most of all, I praised them for their lifelong understanding and love, and that my teachings, my ways, I come first. Everything else is secondary. Over the years, I've given you men to share my visions, my plans for the future. And I knew all along the way, my plans might not be well received. But my little, but my little church never wavered. For deep down, she knew she was right. For she knew it was right. When most of the out outside world said she was wrong, she ignored all and listened to my words, to my calling. My little church, thank you for open ears and bright eyes, but most of all, for open hearts. Make no mistake, where these three dwell, I bless, and my eye is always watching. For where these three dwell, I will always do more than even she thinks she can do. Right now, I praise you for the desire to do more, for I have more prepared for you, and I know my little church is eager. I shared with you earlier, I've always given you a mouthpiece, one who shares my words, my teachings, with all of you. Make no mistake, I still do. On this very day, I still do. The words you hear are mine, not to be swayed by the world all around you. Remember, never forget, I've been by my little church's side from the beginning. Never forget, I was always there when she's been called names and kicked around. But you know what? I'm used to that. For my life, for the most part, was that. Lastly, for my little church on this day, I say to you, think back of why you're sitting here today. Think back for whom you're sitting here today. Think back of how I, how I started you from so humble of beginnings. Think back of all the great things we've done together. Think back of how I've always given you strength and courage to face the world. 
Think back of all the saints I placed in, in, in your lives. Think back of all the places I've taken you. Think back of all the lives you've touched. Now think of all the lives I want you to touch. Memories are a gift from me to you. It lets us know and reminds us where we've been and who we've loved. Dreams and my visions remind you where I might take you. And you, that, and you will show my presence there. For you know wherever you go, I go with you. Lastly, my little church, think back. Every one of you here right now, think back to the day when I knew you and you and knew, you knew me. Think back and remember that day. When the world around you went silent. When all, the ch when all the chatter around you went silent. When all your fears and all your ways, they just didn't seem that important anymore. When all that mattered was my ways, my love for you and your love for me. When you confessed to me your ways were sinful, and I said, I don't care. I love you anyway. Do you remember that day? Today, my little church, remember that. Today, my little church, remember that day. For it was a day just like this, just like this day long ago. I found you, and I claimed you for my own. My little church, never forget I'm here right now. I've always been here. I love you with all I am. I've given you all. With all the power I possess in this world, I cry out, don't leave me now. For you truly are my little church. To Jesus Christ be all glory. Amen.